Uh, good afternoon. This is Aaron Stevens of Berwyn Leighton Paisner. And this is Roger Burlingame of Cobra and Kim. And welcome to the first in a new series of webinars that BLP is running on topics of interest to the financial services and the wider corporate community. I'm a partner in the London office of BLP and the head of our corporate crime and investigations practice. Today, I'm very fortunate to be joined by Roger Burlingame, who is a US white collar crime lawyer and a partner in the London office of Cobra and Kim. In the next 45 minutes, Roger and I will discuss various trends and developments relating to cross-border investigations and enforcement cases. And in doing so, we'll be trying to draw out similarities and differences between the US, the US and the UK and flagging up some pitfalls to be on the lookout for. So as I said, we're gonna to try to stick to 45 minutes with your questions at the end, uh, but I'd just like to walk you through a couple of housekeeping points. Um, Roger and I will answer your questions at the end of the session. So to send us a question, just click on the Q&A tab on the left-hand side of your screen, type your question, and then send away. All the questions are anonymous, so remember there's no such thing as a stupid question. So Roger, I was wondering if you could get the ball rolling for us by talking about the first overarching trend, which is the outsourcing of regulatory and white collar investigations to, law, to firms and to their lawyers, as well as the amount of control that regulators seek to exert over these internal investigations particularly from a U.S. point of view. Thanks, Aaron. So um, unlike in the U.K., which I think you'll speak about in a few moments, the dynamics of internal investigations are fairly well settled in the U.S. Um, the, the way that it's developed is a little bit, is, is helpful to understand the history of, of how the process came to be, which is that in the U.S., corporations are easy to charge um, because the liability stems from one person in the company doing something wrong on behalf of the corporation. Um, there's no judge at the end of the process. And so once an invasive investigation begins, the prosecutors um, can essentially threaten the, the entity into whatever sort of settlement they want because the threat is either you reach an agreement with us or we will indict you, which is something that most um, entities can't withstand. So um, what brings the companies in the door is the hope that by cooperating in these investigations, they're going to be able to uh, eventually either avoid a penalty or get a penalty that is mitigated by the fact of their uh, cooperation. So the point of the internal investigation is obviously to get that cooperation and credit. And the difference, to, to address your question, the difference between uh, where things are in the U.S. and um, where they appear to be in the U.K. right now is that while the U.S. authorities very much expect a uh, internal investigation to be conducted and they have expectations as to how it will be conducted, they typically don't get into the weeds of dictating precisely what the entity and its lawyers should do, what steps should be taken, exactly what conduct should be investigated, the pace at which the investigation should run, the form in which the findings of that investigation are going to be communicated. The problem in the US, and this is the problem we're gonna talk about in the next slide of how to mitigate, is that while there is not um, a message coming from the government as to here's exactly how we want you to run this, if you run it in a way in which the government is unhappy with, then you're gonna be facing a tremendous penalty down the road. So I think that's a little bit different than how things are evolving here in the UK, but maybe Aaron can address that more. Thanks, Roger. So I think in the UK, you need to make a different a distinction between FCA regulatory investigations and SFO criminal investigations. Um, in the regulatory context, uh, firms who are subject to FCA regulation are, are obviously subject to positive obligations to carry out internal investigations and proactively notify the FCA or the PRA, uh, in, if, if that's the case, of any significant issues. An initial uh, notification obligation may even arise before a firm has even had the chance to carry out an investigation or at least a full investigation. Now I'm aware of some instances of the FCA, of the FCA being somewhat prescriptive in how a firm goes about investigating itself. But in most cases, and cer certainly in our experience, early and serious engagement with the FCA to notify it of, of any potential issue, to proactively take steps to define and agree the scope of the investigation, uh, to satisfy the FCA that you're gonna do a credible and independent investigation, 
will enable a firm to retain uh, a sufficient uh, amount of control over their investigation rather than you know, finding itself in a situation where the FCA is telling them what to do or you know, at the extreme, uh, appointing a Section 166 FISMA skilled person to, to carry out an investigation or even kicking the thing to immediately into enforcement. Um, in the corporate crime context and you know, looking at the SFO, um, and if, particularly if you look outside the regulated sector, there's no strict obligation on a corporate to carry out internal investigations or indeed to notify the SFO of any problems uncovered by investigations. So an unregulated corporate is in a position where they have much more choice as to how to approach this type of situation and different corporates take different approaches and the position is to some extent evolving. Um, but where a corporate decides that it's going to go down that road of proactively notifying the SFO of a potential problem or potential criminal offense that's been carried out within its organization, it, it's reasonable to expect the SFO to take possibly a little bit more of a hands-on and prescriptive approach to how the corporate conducts any internal investigation. And that's particularly the case if the SFO has opened up their own parallel investigation at the same time. And we'll come on to more detail on this on the next slide. Great, so um, the slide here talks about the quid pro quo for regulators outsourcing, outsourcing their investigative work. And um, by way of background, I worked at the Department of Justice as an assistant US attorney uh, for 10 years in New York. And I remember you, I followed a very typical career pattern, which was beginning doing um, more sort of drugs and blood and guts sort of crimes for the first few years and then graduating and doing the latter part of my career uh, on white collar work. And when you, I made that transition, I was amazed to discover that instead of my cases being staffed by me and perhaps one FBI agent, they were staffed by me, the FBI agent, and the entire resources of the giant law firm, which was now at my disposal to help me find out what was happening in the case that I was investigating. So it's a remarkable resource for the government to have the assistance of, um, of law firms and their armies of associates and, and then often um, investigators hired at their disposal. And the question is, how can you as the entity being investigated make sure that you're getting something out of this arrangement? And um, as Aaron was re referring to, the key to, to securing that quo is to take an engaged and proactive approach throughout the course of the investigation. And, and your ultimate goals here or you want to, to limit the scope of the investigation so that you're not boiling the oceans and looking any further than you need to for, for the wrongdoing that's been discovered. Uh, you want to limit the scope creep throughout the investigation so that you don't start with one problem and if it can be avoided, end up with a whole different set of problems. And ultimately, over the course of the investigation, you want to become the expert of the fact and the trusted partner of the government who uh, eventually you buy credibility that's going to be allow, allow you to make the sorts of factual and possibly legal arguments at the end of the process that may be very helpful to your client. So the question is how to do that. And the key, as Aaron was saying, is to get buy-in from the start. And, and the key to being able to do that is to jump on the problem extremely early. You want to find out as much as you possibly can about the facts. First of all, to make the determination as to whether this is something that would merit um, self-reporting. And if you do make the decision to self-report, which is not always a given, but in many cases that decision will be made. And if it is made, when you start, you, you have much more knowledge than the government does. And so you will be able to present to them as to here is the problem, and here is our specific plan as to how to investigate this problem and come back to you with the results of our investigation. And if you can initially get that buy-in to the government as to that they agree with the steps that you're going to be taking, then you're going to be able to ensure that you're not gonna face that situation where after having spent a significant amount of time and money conducting an internal investigation, it turns out that the government doesn't think that you've been a bona fide partner in the investigation and it has all been for, for naught. So this approach, if done correctly, can, um, can yield 
really big benefits. And I just want to tell one story to dramatize that from my own career as a prosecutor, which is in one of the corporate final pro corporate prosecutions I was doing against a large pharmaceutical company. Um, the lawyers were taking a very combative approach from the start. And it, as the prosecutor was incentivizing me to view the company negatively and to want to expand the scope of my investigation to see why I was facing this resistance and, and what there was to be hidden. Eventually, the company figured out that, that this lawyer was not um, handling the representation the way they would have liked. They replaced him. And two years later, the company did have a problem. And they found themselves um, having to accept some responsibility for that and reach an agreement with the government, which involved a payment. But I found myself in writing the documents that ended the case and the press release, thinking, mm, I don't want to say that. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure we should push that far because I had gained so much respect for the new lawyer that they brought in that I I did not want to, um, you know, on a personal level, humiliate him and stretch beyond, you know, in in close call situations, push things uh, as far as I might, and also because I could rely on what he had told me during the course of the investigation. And so I think that establishing that kind of relationship can be enormously valuable to the company. And the way that you do that is by getting that early buy-in from the government where you, you can establish your position over the course of the investigation to be that trusted partner. Great. Um, just picking up from the UK side of things then, I think this whole idea of a quid pro quo and, and outsourcing of investigations is less formally developed here in the UK than in the US. But certainly for a number of years, at least in the FCA context, um, taking a proactive approach, getting in and notifying the FCA uh, early on, and, and really being uh, cooperative in those early stages um, has, has always been a, a strategy for, for hoping to, to solve a problem and to rectify a systems and controls issue without uh, going into an enforcement process with the FCA. Um, in more recent times, we're getting, I think, more kind of certain indications of the potential, uh, you know, quo in the quid pro quo for, um, for, for acting in this way. Um, again, in the FCA context, uh, Jamie Symington gave a speech uh, towards the end of last year where he laid out the FCA's expectations of firms carrying out internal investigations. And there's a lot in that speech, but I thought I'd just flag up a few key points. And the first is that Jamie Symington said that the FCA is, is very much willing to give credit or, or leniency to firms that you know, assist it to unravel potential misconduct quickly and efficiency, uh, efficiently. And in doing that, he, he really stressed the importance of self-reporting and of early engagement with the regulator to discuss and agree the scope of any internal investigation that's carried out. Um, he also stressed the, the real importance of putting together an investigation plan and team which is which is both independent and credible and is seen to be independent and credible and demonstrating a willingness a real willingness to share the output uh, of the investigation openly fully and promptly and that obviously brings up the uh, the perennial issue of legal professional privilege um, and what mr simington said in summary is is in effect you know, we don't want to see firms trying to game the process by hiding facts and especially unhelpful facts within privileged documents. Um, you know, if you're carrying out an investigation, if you want us to take it uh, seriously and rely upon it and think of it as credible, then you need to find some way of communicating to us the facts that you've uncovered. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean waiving privilege over interview notes. Um, you can do it another way, but we need the factual narrative. Um, and we don't want to see people, as I said, gaming the process to try to hide unhelpful facts. He also mentioned that um, this strategy that I think some uh, firms have possibly adopted in the past of trying to say to the, to the FCA, well, we'll come in and give you an oral briefing on the findings of our investigation is just not a suitable substitute. They, they need uh, you know, proper documenta documentation uh, of facts and findings um, if you're going to expect them to take your investigation credibly. Um, but, you know, in appropriate cases where firms approach things in this way, then this can easily lead to the FCA declining to open any enforcement case, um, or at the very least help to mitigate the severity of any financial penalty or other sanction that they impose at the end of the process. And certainly we at BLP have had various matters where we've 
been able to keep a client out of enforcement by taking this kind of a proactive approach. I think by contrast, the SFO has sent out some confusing and contradictory signals in recent times. You might recall the SFO at, at one stage complaining that internal investigations simply churn up the crime scene and thus are, are not considered to be helpful. This was interpreted by many as a, as a warning from the SFO not to carry out internal investigations. But it also begged the question, if corporates themselves are not carrying out internal investigations, how can the SFO reasonably expect to receive self-reports of corporate wrongdoing? Uh, the, the SFO obviously does not have unlimited resources, so like it or not, it really does need corporates to behave responsibly, to carry out internal investigations, uh, and to self-report uh, inappropriate cases. Um, more recently, I think the SFO has been a bit more helpful in providing some detail on its position. And in a, meet, a speech in May of this year, the SFO made it clear that any company that's looking to maximize the possibility of a non-criminal disposal will be in a much better position if it actively engages with the SFO and self-reports potential issues uh, to the agency rather than simply waiting to see if the SFO finds out about the wrongdoing through other means. And in this regard, I think it's important just to bear in mind how many different ways wrongdoing can now come to the surface. You obviously have whistleblowers um, in the States. Uh, we all know that whistleblowers are financially incentivized by the authorities to, to uh, blow the whistle and can receive multi-million pound uh, rewards for doing so, where successful enforcement cases are brought on the back of the information they provide. In the UK, there's been more uh, interest and more regulation around whistleblowers in recent times. Um, so that's one uh, way that things come to the surface, uh, even where a corporate doesn't self-report. You obviously have competitors who might feel aggrieved uh, in, in a situation um, and will seek to provide information to the authorities to, uh, to, to bring something out. Uh, you have investigative journalists. We've seen with the Panama Papers and other situations, you know, very sophisticated operations um, by investigative journalists and, and huge uh, uh, data dumps being made of quite confidential and, and in some cases privileged information. And then you've got suspicious activity reports being made to the NCA by, by various uh, uh, companies and firms in the regulated sector, which are more and more shared uh, between the different regulators. The, you know, the NCA will share that with the SFO. They will share that with the FCA where appropriate. So that's something, you know, I'm not necessarily advocating self-reporting in every situation or in any situation, but it's something that has to go into the equation um, when you're considering whether to self-report is, you know, are the authorities going to find out about this in any event? And if so, isn't it better that they find out about it from us uh, in a proactive way? Now, the speech in May made it clear that companies aren't expected to immediately pick up the phone to the SFO the moment they become aware of potential wrongdoing. Um, but the expectation is that companies will engage at an early stage. And what that means in practice is that once you've started investigating something internally, and once you have enough evidence and have come to the view that the concerns that you're investigating are not fanciful, they're real, they're substantive, um, then that's the, the moment in time to start engaging with the SFO if you decide uh, to follow that approach. Um, in terms of the amount of control the SFO will uh, exert, um, according to the speech, uh, the SFO has said that it's not their job to tell corporates how to carry out investigations. So in terms of what lines of inquiry to follow, who to interview, what documents to review, et cetera. That's not the SFO's job, that's, that's your own prerogative. However, on the flip side, they do expect genuine, unequivocal cooperation from companies. Um, and this does not, according to this recent speech, mean necessarily requiring companies to waive valid claims to legal uh, privilege um, over materials that are generated by that internal investigation. Rather, the key thing that the SFO wants from a firm conducting an internal investigation is the factual narrative and for the firm to work with the SFO to identify the full extent of any wrongdoing. Um, I think if that's the situation in a purely internal investigation where the SFO is sort of waiting back and, and, and you know, holding its own um, uh, counsel as to whether it will open up its own investigation. If at the same time that you as a firm are investigating something, the SFO has opened up its own parallel investigation, then I think you can expect them to be a bit more prescriptive about um, how you go about investigating. And we've all heard you know, situations, for example, of the SFO telling 
firms, you know, that they can't interview certain people or they can't do certain things because they don't want the SFO's investigation to be uh, somehow prejudiced. Um, very quickly, I thought I'd just mention that a, a couple of days ago, the SFO published some new guidance on Section 2 interviews. So you'll, you'll recall that Section 2 is the power under the Criminal Justice Act where the director of the SFO can compel uh, anyone really to, to attend the SFO to give evidence um, and they must answer questions and provide documents uh, to the SFO unless they have a reasonable excuse not to. Um, this is a, a very you know, strong power that the SFO has. And typically, people who are interrogated by the SFO in this way have brought legal advisors along with them. Um, the SFO is taking a little bit more of a robust approach now through this guidance in making it very clear that at the end of the day, there's no right to bring along a lawyer as when you're just a witness in the Section 2 context, um, and that they have a discretion to exclude legal advisors from Section 2 interviews. Um, and so they've proposed a or, or mandated a procedure that must be followed uh, where you're uh, uh, required to attend the SFO under Section 2 to request that a lawyer be allowed to attend with you. Um, and, and there's a number of things uh, that need to, to be satisfied in that regard. We've actually published a blog on this um, on our website. So if you want more information, then just check the BLP website. And you can see the blog right there. Um, but it, does, it will have, I think, a big effect on the ability of corporates to send their lawyers along with their employees to a uh, Section 2 interview, um, because the view of the SFO is that a company's lawyers coming along with an employee, uh, that there's too much of a risk of a conflict of interest, there's too much of a risk that the company will try to uh, prejudice the investigation or stop the employee from talking openly and freely. So that's something just to be aware of in terms of the SFO exerting more control over investigations. So, Moving on then to our next trend, which is internationalization. Um, it's obviously no secret that the financial markets are, are more global than ever, and that as a result, financial regulators and enforcement authorities have been modifying their approach in an attempt to properly monitor and enforce uh, market cleanliness. Uh, and obviously, unfortunately, for banks and other financial firms, this means that an instance of misconduct in one jurisdiction or in one part of the world can easily lead to scrutiny by multiple authorities across the world. And these authorities you know, may have very different approaches. They may have varying degrees of sophistication. Um, and so that can cause all kinds of complications. At the same time, the, the more sophisticated authorities like the US and the UK have been developing and using information gateways between them to, to more closely coordinate their supervisory and investigatory functions. And we certainly have seen situations even recently where uh, US authorities at a very early stage um, seem to have access to documents, to information, uh, which they must have got through some kind of mutual legal assistance with other authorities around the world. Um, and so uh, it's clear that there is a, a, a huge amount of coordination going on, even at very early stages of, of a matter. Roger, can you give us some insight into the frequency and depth of cooperation that you see between U.S. and U.K. authorities? Sure, and thanks. So um, it's interesting. I think this is one of the areas where the U.S. government's approach has changed most dramatically in just the last five years. Um, when I was at the Department of Justice, and this was also true for the other regulatory authorities in the United States, uh, the approach was that there was competition for cases, furious competition for cases, among the various different regulators and prosecuting agencies, and um, that international prosecutors and regulatory agencies were viewed uh, similarly to domestic competitors, which is race to finish the case and try and finish your investigation and get a result before anyone else does because they're going to cut you out of it. Um, the situation now couldn't be more different. Uh, I have a, a friend um, from my days as a prosecutor who is now, has recently returned to the fraud section of the Department of Justice, and uh, he's the head of the section, and he was telling me that um, this too, he spent a stint in private practice, and that this was a shocking change for him, that when he left, you know, it's the same situation that I described as far as uh, international context, and that now, it's rare that a day goes by, and certainly not a week goes by, where he's not on the phone with international uh, regulators 
coordinating um, cases which are being jointly investigated in the U.S. and abroad and sharing information on cases which maybe are not being investigated by the U.S. or not being investigated by the foreign authorities. And I think that the lesson that DOJ has learned is that they can, they can make more cases by sharing rather than fighting, and that's led to the situation that we now see. And I, I think that the broader effects of this um, where, where actually that this is a reflection of the trend which has, has led to the situation that we're in now with respect to the U.S. government's um, role as a, as a global regulator, which is that uh, the financial crisis spawned an army of white-collar uh, prosecutors and regulators in the United States. Um, when I was with the Department of Justice, um, in a, right after the financial, but prior to the financial crisis, I would say that there were less than 50 real prosecutors focusing solely on white collar work. Uh, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, but that number is, is multiplied um, significantly since then and now standing in the hundreds and there's uh, a myriad different agencies which weren't touching white collar, serious white collar work, let alone doing international white collar investigations that are now hugely active. And um, the most active area, of course, is in the financial sector. And the most active spot in the financial sector is London, where uh, London is effectively being treated as the new New York, that you know you have this greatly expanded ranks of white collar prosecutors and regulators, and there is only so much financial crime for them to go after in the United States. And so London has become the next natural stepping stone. Um, and this doesn't mean, of course, that you are always going to be facing um, a U.S. prosecutor wherever you are in the world, but um, there is certainly going to be that coordination that we've talked about on significant cases, and I think the U.S. has shown that where they feel that there's inadequate consequences from the local authorities, they're going to step in, and where the behavior is um, significant enough, they're going to step in even if the local authorities have. And so in the LIBOR and Forex cases, for example, you have uh, fines being paid by entities both towards the United States and towards uh, UK and other authorities. And unfortunately, what this has spawned is a culture in which the investigators are, uh, globally are starting to compete as to who is the toughest and who's going to be doling out the, the harshest penalties and um, competing most aggressively for these cases. And I think that on a personal level, the, the example of this is, is Tom Hayes, who was um, prosecuted in the, in the UK, I'm sure as you all know, for, um, his, for LIBOR and was prosecuted in the UK because he was afraid of the terrible sentence that he might face in the UK, or at least that seemed to be in the, the sorry, in the US, that seemed to be the explanation for his decisions. And then, in fact, he was hit with a tremendously harsh sentence, probably much harsher than he would have faced in the U.S. And I, I think the explanation for that, obviously reading a lot of tea leaves, is that the U.K. authorities thought to themselves, um, I, I don't want to be seen as the, the patsy in comparison to the U.S. And, and Tom Hayes was the um, recipient of that. And I think we're seeing the same thing as to entities happening at, at, a, at a higher level. So just keeping to this trend for a second, and we need to keep moving along to stick to our 45 minutes, but um, it's, it's obviously it, the case that in an environment of more global supervision and enforcement like this, it's critical for, for firms to have expert advice and guidance from lawyers and others who can help to guide them through the local regulatory enforcement processes that might apply in different jurisdictions, and, and crucially, to help them understand certain key issues. And the ones I'd flag up at this stage are you know, what are the regulatory notification obligations that might exist in different parts of the world and in different systems? And when do those obligations to notify crystallize? It's, it's all good and well to, you know, know when you're supposed to be re reporting to the FCA, but what about all the other regulatory authorities around the world who might also be interested in a particular situation? Um, and, and so making sure that you're on top of that. Two, the availability and the utility of legal professional privilege in any particular jurisdiction how it might be waived, either on purpose or accidentally, uh, the consequences of waiver. These are all important things to get to grips with at the very, very beginning of an investigation. And then thirdly, I'd say the impact of data protection and privacy rules on how you carry out 
and investigation and how you, for example, transmit data, uh, in, you know, email, uh, chats, et cetera, across borders as part of your investigation. Um, so each of these topics on their own can be quite technical, quite complicated. So I'm just flagging them up now at a high level and we'll address them in, in, in some more detail a bit later. But the key message is that in any cross-border investigation situation, you should be getting to grips with these three key points as soon as possible at the start of the investigation. Now, on our slides, the next bullet uh, relates to joint defense agreements and common interest privilege. And Roger, perhaps you can give a quick explanation as to what a joint defense agreement is uh, in, the, in a U.S. context. Sure. So uh, very simply, a joint defense agreement is that uh, two people who are in the same position with respect to an investigating authority can have privileged communications as long as they share that common interest against the um, authority. And so how this is typically used in investigations, both into individuals and entities, is <clears throat> to exchange information and learn information about what's happening in the investigation. So in the case of a company um, that is being investigated, the company will be hiring lawyers for the individuals, and the lawyers for the individuals are going to be benefited greatly in doing their job if they can receive information from the company that the company knows by dint of the in internal investigation it's been doing and its communications with the investigating authority about, um, uh, about what they'll be facing in their interview. And then similarly, when, when an individual goes and is interviewed by the investigating authority to be able to have a conversation afterwards that's completely privileged with the company's lawyers, um, relaying back the substance of what happened, thereby giving the company that greater insight into the investigation and um, allowing the next person in the chain to have to be all the better represented. So it's helpful for the individuals. It's also helpful for the entity and um, and the conversations are privileged. And one um, added ben benefit is that oftentimes uh, there will be formal joint defense agreements and one of the provisions of the joint defense agreement will be notification to others in the agreement in the joint defense group when someone is dropping out of the joint defense group. And what that signifies is this person is no longer similarly positioned to you, i.e. they're starting to talk to the government and on the road to becoming a cooperating witness. And so that can be extremely helpful in figuring out, um, engaging the strength of the government's case, either against an individual or an entity by having a sense as to uh, you know, who, who is on which side. So these types of formal written joint defense agreements are, are less common feature here in the UK, but we obviously do have similar principles around common interest privilege. And it's always important for lawyers to take steps to preserve common interest privilege and, and to be alive to situations where the interest of a, of a firm and an individual or the interest amongst different individuals uh, begins to diverge. There's, there's another really interesting difference, I think, between the US and the UK, and one that many people in the UK maybe don't understand, and that's the use in the U.S. of what are known as proffers. Roger, can you just give us a bit of, uh, of an education on proffers? Sure. So very simply, <clears throat> excuse me, proffers are um, a, w a way in which people who are under investigation typically can communicate with the investigators. And so uh, the an interview of, say, that same employee who's at a company that's being investigated with with in investigating authorities will take place under a proper agreement, which means that the information that's that's discussed during the proper session cannot be used as substantive evidence against uh, the person, but that the authorities could use that to follow up on investigative leads, or possibly if the person lied, there could be consequences for that, or they could be cross-examined um, with any conflicting late, uh, testimony in a later proceeding. Um, so that's the basics of what a proffer is and what a proffer agreement or a queen for a day agreement um, is and what protection it provides. Uh, there's also the attorney proffer, which would be uh, representing um, to the government a certain set of facts that your client would be able to provide to the government if the government was to speak with them in hopes of typically for an individual securing cooperation or securing perhaps uh, immunity from prosecution if the person was to come in and make this statement. It's in a way to communicate with the government about what your client might say without um, 
subjecting your clients to potential penalty for um, lying during the uh, the interview. You know, obviously your client is going to be well advised not to lie, but the, the government can always take a different view as to what the truth is and um, limiting your options at trial down the road. Um, finally, there's a reverse proffer which had been taking place according to the newspapers in London with some of the Forex, uh, the subjects of the Forex interviews. And what that is, is the US government reaching out to people who are under investigation and saying, uh, we'd like to meet with you. You don't have to say anything. Here's all of our evidence against you. This is why you are going to lose when we bring a charge against you. And uh, the point of making this presentation is the hope that the person will conclude that their best avenue is not to fight the case, but is to cooperate and therefore allow the government to make the case stronger against others who it's hoping to prosecute. Yeah, and I think it's all that's all very interesting, and it's, it's very different from the UK. Um, obviously, the US doesn't have uh, something similar to uh, what I talked about earlier, the Section 2 power to basically compel someone to come in to override their right of silence. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, in a US context, that just simply doesn't really happen because of the Fifth Amendment rights, um, et cetera. Um, so the only analog or the most close analog for this queen for a day process here in the UK is that Section 2 process where you know, your, your right of silence is overridden by the authorities, but they can't use any of the material that you uh, disclose to them in that process against you, except in very limited circumstances. Um, which are similar to the circum to the exceptions in the states. Another quite interesting um, difference that we come across in our practice is the difference between U.S. lawyers and English or U.K. lawyers in their approach to uh, witness preparation. Um, and I think that the the basic point here to say is that uh, in general terms, U.S. lawyers will often take a much more hands-on and detailed approach to witness preparation, uh, which in many cases will you know culminate in those lawyers subjecting a witness to a mock interview that will very closely resemble what the witness will actually encounter at a, at a formal interview with the authorities. And this, I think, reflects the approach taken in U.S. litigation and in arbitration where um, it would be considered negligent for a lawyer to fail to prepare a witness in this manner. Um, on the flip side, though, a lot of English lawyers look at this type of preparation and think that it amounts to effectively coaching a witness what to say. Um, and in English civil litigation, the professional conduct and ethical rules very much limit a lawyer's ability to coach a witness. Um, and I think in, you know, rightly or wrongly, this um, practice and restriction has carried over into the world of investigation. So you'll, you'll sometimes see situations where a client will have U.S. and U.K. counsel and they'll be preparing for an interview. And, and the approach that's taken by the two sets of legal teams to preparing them for an interview will be quite different. Roger, do you have anything quick to add on this? No, I think that's exactly right. And I think that that can be one of the benefits of where you are in a situation where you have U.S. and U.K. counsel is that uh, U.S. counsel is not only more comfortable in that role, but is more experienced in that role because it's a, a standard part of witness prep and that it would be, frankly, negligent to not, not provide that sort of uh, preparation for, for clients prior to uh, interviews or, or testimony in court. So moving on to the, the next slide, um, which is our, our penultimate substantive slide, and, and uh, we're running a little bit tight on time, so we're going to move through this one quickly. Um, this is continuing, continuing on the theme of internationalization and um, tactical consider considerations. And, and really, your primary concern early on is to try and figure out where your problem is coming from. Um, and throughout all of the different steps of the investigation, how you're taking notes, where you're operating, what sort of data privacy uh, concerns are you going to take into account? You're going to be have your eye focused on where are you most likely to ultimately be presenting, and then of course the most complicated questions come up um, and come up frequently, unfortunately, where you are being investigated by multiple different um, authorities simultaneously, and it often puts you uh, gives you a Hobson's choice of which of these investigators are you going to decide that you ultimately want to please if. It's impossible to please both at the same time. And a perfect example of that is with data privacy, where the US approach is they, they've had many, many years of training that they ask for materials, they ask for an investigation, and the law firm is going to go get those materials and do the investigation very thoroughly. And um, 
the prosecutors in the United States are unimpressed with the excuse of that data privacy laws prevent us from obtaining certain materials and uh, expect the lawyers for entities under investigation to figure out a creative way to solve these problems. And frankly, if the problems can't be solved, the, they're happy to present the choice to the entity of either violating the data privacy provisions or um, risking their cooperation credit. And I'm not sure they're gonna put it to you that starkly, but that is what the ultimate, um, uh, what is ultimately being uh, judged. And so I've had, um, I know of many situations in which the client has had to take the risk of, of violating a, a data privacy protection overseas or data privacy law overseas because there is no way that you're going to have a good result uh, with the U.S. authority um, saying, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be able to get you these key materials. And another consideration that plays into how you might make these kind of tactical priority judgments is the, the different theories of corporate liability that exist between the U.S. and the U.K., or at least at present. Um, you know, Roger already touched on the fact that in the U.S., uh, pursuant to the doctrine of respondeat superior, uh, a corporation can be, become liable for um, a criminal offense if any employee at any level of the organization uh, commits a criminal offense in the scope of their employment. Um, in the UK, we obviously still have, um, uh, at least as a matter of common law, this idea or this doctrine of directing will in mind liability. So a, a corporate, as a matter of common law, cannot be uh, charged with a criminal offense unless there's evidence demonstrating that someone in the brain of the company, so at the level of the board or quite senior management, was actively involved in the criminality themselves. Now, there, there can be specific acts of parliament that create corporate criminal liability, and probably the best well uh, known one in recent times is the Bribery Act, which created the Section, section 7 failure to prevent offense. Um, but outside of that, as a general point, you know, the, the differences between corporate criminal liability between the US and UK are still quite stark. Um, but I think the thing just to be aware of is that this is rapidly changing. Uh, we've recently had a, announced that there's going to be a consultation this summer on um, expa expanding that Section 7 formulation to other types of corporate misconduct. So uh, a, a strict liability offense for failure to prevent fraud, a strict liability offense for failure to prevent money laundering. And we have also the, uh, which I think is even more certain to come into force, the failure to prevent the facilitation of tax evasion. Um, so we may well be in a situation soon where that kind of uh, regulatory arbitrage between the US and the UK in terms of where are you more at risk of corporate liability um, won't really be as, as stark as it is at the moment. The other thing we're gonna pick up quickly, and I, I'm just gonna fly through it because we don't have time, is, is just differences in privilege. Um, and anyone who has studied privilege will know that there are you know, quite particular differences between the US and the UK in a corporate context in terms of how easy or hard it might be for a, for a privileged communication to happen between a lawyer and its corporate client. Um, and I won't go through the whole three rivers uh, formulation there, but I'll just flag it up. Obviously there's differences in terms of uh, the extent to which lawyers can communicate with third parties in the UK. You, it, to safely be able to cloak those kind of communications in privilege, you'd want to be able to rely on litigation privilege that doesn't always uh, exist in the context of an internal investigation. The way that you go about uh, creating interview notes is a, is, a, is an area which needs a lot of care uh, to, to try, if you want to, to try to create those in a privileged way or separately if you want to do something else um, and then put down the factual narrative in a, in a non-privileged uh, format. Um, England recognizes this concept of a, of a limited waiver. So being able to say, I'm going to waive privilege over documents only vis-a-vis -vis the FCA, for example, but that doesn't amount to a waiver uh, against all other parties who might want to get those same documents and might want to sue me in a civil court. Um, that's not the case in the States. You know, if you waive privilege as a general matter, uh, then, you know, with one party, then you've effectively waived it with others. Um, and so, and then there's all kinds of complicated things to think through uh, where you've got a, a cross-border or multi-jurisdictional investigation regarding you know, whose privilege rules are actually going to apply um, when you know, all this information is flowing back and forth over borders. Um, but we'll move on from there to our final slide, um, which is just quickly a focus on individual accountability. 
And I expect that most or all of you on the call will have heard of the Yates memo that was published towards the end of last year. Uh, but hopefully Roger can just give us a quick summary of what it is and how it impacts the way that firms carry out internal investigations. Right, so the, the, when the Yates memo was issued, everybody who had been a federal prosecutor and was asked the question, does this change anything, the immediate answer was no, because there has always been a, um, a real focus uh, within the Department of Justice and on, on holding individuals accountable where possible. Um, I think that the, uh, with the amount of time that's passed since the Yates memo was issued, the, the, that answer would have changed, which is that the, the muddled messages coming out of the Department of Justice about the possibility for corporations to receive cooperation credit without individual prosecutions have led to a situation in which, even though I think the, the Department of Justice's approach remains the same, there is now a much greater focus on trying to provide individuals and frankly a worry on the part of entities that if they don't provide individuals they may not be able to get uh, cooperation credit. DOJ has has tried to explain that that is not the case and um, there are certainly historically and recently been plenty of um, resolutions where the company has accepted criminal responsibility without individuals being prosecuted but it is not a good position uh, currently to be an individual in a company that's under investigation if you are in any way tied to what's being uh, investigated. Um, and and actually, given how short we are on time, I think that's probably a good place to end at. Okay, and just in terms of the UK, I think it's, it's fair to say that there is a similar focus on individual accountability. We don't have anything like the Yates memo per se, but we have the senior managers regime, which um, clearly in terms of creating uh, well, one of its purposes is, is to create um, a, a blueprint as to who within large banks and other regulated firms is actually responsible for certain areas of the business. And then that leads to the situation where if there's a problem, it's much easier to identify and, and take action against them. Um, and certainly uh, in a, both a regulatory sense and in a financial crime sense, we are expecting more and more scrutiny of individuals, more and more cases to be brought against individuals um, in the future. Uh, on the pure kind of corporate crime side, you know, where the deferred prosecution agreements come into effect and, the, you know, the FCA can't do deferred prosecution agreements, but the SFO can. Um, and there's an impact on individuals there as well. Um, as part of the cooperation that ICBC Standard Bank uh, provided to the SFO in order to get its DPA, you know, it's uh, no doubt part of that was a, a, a willingness to cooperate in helping the authorities not only here, but in other parts of the world, investigate the conduct of individuals and to assist those investigations. And I think that'll be a feature of DPAs going forward, is that part of that package of cooperation that a, a firm will try to offer to the authorities is, you know, we are going to offer up to you, you know, compelling evidence of, of who the actual human beings are that were responsible for this. Um, so that brings us to the end of our time. Um, there's a final uh, little uh, slide that we just put on here. We're not going to talk to it, but it just sets out for you some of the key challenges of investigations. Um, we hope the firm, uh, we hope this has been a useful session and we're very happy to answer any questions, although I don't know if there are any um, at this stage. Um, before anyone goes, can I just encourage you to sign up for the next webinar in this series, which is on the subject of how to prepare for the market abuse regulation. If you just go to the resources tab on the left hand side of your screen, You'll be able to see. Uh, you'll be able. You'll be able to click directly onto a link to register for that session. So, if there are no questions, then from myself and from Roger, um, thank you very much, and we hope this has been helpful. Yes, thank you. And if anybody has any individual questions they'd like to follow up with, um, I think we can bring onto the screen uh, Mayan Aaron's contact information, and we're certainly happy to field any inquiries anyone may have. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you.